Good day, friends. Welcome again to the Desire of Ages Ministries. I am your host, Pastor Samuel Ryan. Today, we're going to be discussing the prophecy in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. And I've entitled it, In the Toenails of Time. We can go from our head down to our feet. And when we get down to our feet, the last thing that we can look at is our toes and then our toenails. And so I believe that in the history of the world today that we're in the toenails of time, meaning the appearing of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus is the next event, the next great event. Of course, we know the mark of the beast and Sunday law is gonna occur, but the greatest event, Jesus' rescue plan put in motion, his evacuation plan put in motion to rescue his children, those who have obeyed him and have given their lives to him by sacrifice, accepting his righteousness, accepting his merit, that they will be called home to live with him forevermore. In mansions, John 14, 1, 2, that he has made ready. He's just looking for occupants. I want to be an occupant to one of those mansions, don't you? And so Jesus is inviting us to his kingdom, to be saints in his kingdom, to so that we may escape out of this world through us. Okay, so we have a journey to go, a journey, a walk away that Jesus Christ has laid out already. And he has made this secure through the blood that he has shed at Golgotha on Calvary's cross just for you and just for me. So are you making ready? Am I making ready? So let's discover together from God's holy word, the Bible, his love letter to us, the message that he has laid out for us in Daniel chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar's great dream, as I've entitled it again, the toenails of time. But before we do so, let us have a word of prayer. Father and our God, we thank you today for this message the message that you would declare to us from your Bible. Let the Holy Spirit direct our minds, direct our thoughts. Uh, and as I speak, oh God, let it be under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that only the truths of your Holy Word would be proclaimed and that anything else that is uttered, anything else that is quoted, oh dear Father, that those would be just information to show us where we are in history. So bless this talk, bless this video, that it will educate those who will watch it. And oh Father, in the end, that we will be careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let us see what the Bible has to say concerning this great dream of Nebuchadnezzar found in Daniel chapter two, in the toenails of time, in the toenails of time, the king's dream, the great king, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, secured between the Euphrates and the Tig Tigris River, this major kingdom as found in Daniel chapter two. Let's start with a reading found in Gospel Workers, page 148. My minister and brethren, she said, as you stand before the people, speak of those things that are essential, those things that will instruct. That's what I seek to intend to do today. Teach the great practical truths that must be brought into the light. Teach the saving power of Jesus in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1 verse 14. Strive to make your hearers comprehend the power of truth Ministers should present the sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of Seventh-day Adventists. The prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation should be carefully studied, and in connection with them, the words, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. And this is what I intend to do today, to declare the sure word of prophecy, and today found in the book of Daniel. Let's see another, the great controversy. 
In Isaiah 8, verse 20, the Bible says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because that there is no life in them. Great Controversy, page 593, reads, The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive power of spirits of darkness. Hmm. Satan employs every possible device to prevent men from obtaining our knowledge of the Bible, for its plain utterances reveal his deceptions. At every revival of God's work, the prince of evil is aroused to more intense activity. He is now putting forth his utmost efforts for a final struggle against Christ and his followers. It continues. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Friends, this is where we are today in earth history. The last great delusion is just ahead. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. The Bible must be our God. The Bible must be the standard, the principles of which we use to discover counterfeits. But we, we must always start at truth. Truth must always be the foundation. We don't start at error to discover truth. We, we start at truth to dispel error, to dispel sin, to dispel the counterfeit. To share from God's word, it is written, the devil himself flee from such words in the name of Jesus Christ. By their testimony and, and every statement and every miracle must be tested. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. That's what the Bible is used for, friends. It is for faith to guide us to the salvation found in Jesus Christ. Those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. This is the only place that we can stand, friends. And so, as we continue in the toenails of time, let's see what prophecy declares. How do we understand prophecy? Where does it come from? Who is the author of it? Let's see what it says here in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. I am God. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God himself knows the things that are not yet done. He knows the future. So how do we get to be a part of this? How do we come to be a part of God's vision? Let's look at First Chronicles. Let's look at First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12. If you would go there with me. First Chronicles chapter 12. And let's see what the Bible has there to say. First Chronicles chapter 12. <clears throat> Speaking about Issachar, the Bible says, verse 32, and of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. I want to have understanding of the times. I want to be an Issachar to know what Israel ought to do. Oh, friends, that's a very major, major principle. I want to know what I ought to do. I want to understand God's plan of salvation for me. I want to be saved, don't you? The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Have understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. This is what prophecy is, friends, that we have understanding of the times. Of course, God's time timetable is different to our timetable, but we must seek to understand God's timetable, reading and studying prophecies, seeing what God has there for us. Okay? This is what we must do. So we're talking about Nabu, Kudari Asur, 
also known as Nabuchadnezzar. His God, the name of his God, Nabu, and he's the king, he's the great king, Zar, right? This was Nebuchadnezzar's name. And so he went into Jerusalem and besieged it and took prisoners, took individuals that would further give prominence, power to his kingdom. Let's see, Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 1. Right? We're in the book of Daniel, right? We're in the book of Daniel chapter 2. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 1 and see, see the history there of what Nebuchadnezzar, what Nebuchadnezzar did. Verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. What did he do? Let's go down to verse 3. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, verse 4, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Nebuchadnezzar chose the prime individuals out of Jerusalem, princes, those who had learning, those who had wisdom, because he wants to enhance his kingdom. He wants to enhance Babylon. With all this wisdom that he has, all the wisdom of these men, plus his wisdom, and his astrologers and counselors, he's figuring, I'm going to have the greatest kingdom in the world. And he thought so, and proclaimed the very same the very same sentiments. So he took these individuals down to Babylon. What is Babylon? Let's see the explanation for this. Babylon. And this, of course, in Iraq, site of Nebuchadnezzar's summer palace. It's not there anymore. It's not there anymore. What is this Babylon? What is this Babylon? Babylon, ancient temple, Babylon, Mesopotamia. Oh, this is an artist's rendition of the Tower of Babel. And so the Britannica in the Tower of Babel, its definition says, which is Babylonian, was called Babylon, gate of God, Hebrew from Babel or Babel. The similarity in pronunciation of Babel and Balal to confuse led to the play on words in Genesis 11, 9. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. So, yes, when we look at Babel, 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 Baalal, it means confusion, yes, but look here. Gate of God. The individuals, they were trying to create this awesome edifice that they suggest would reach up to heaven. So just in case God brings another judgment of water or any judgment that God would bring, that they would be able to escape the judgment of God by climbing up into this high edifice as it reach up to heaven. They're seeking another way. They're seeking another way of salvation. They're seeking another way to everlasting life and suggest that they can create their own gate, their own gateway to God outside of Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. That's what John 14 verse 6 says. He's the only way. He's the only truth. He's the only way of life. Jesus. There is no other gateway to God, no matter what man has devised. And so this man thought, maybe I can recreate Babylon. As you see over here, he's, he was building, he was rebuilding the summer palace in, 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 in the desert. Babylon, trying to resurrect it. He trying to become the great king of Iraq. Saddam Hussein, inside the abandoned Babylon that Saddam Hussein built, what Saddam Hussein tried to build because he doesn't exist anymore, is off the scene of time. He should have read Jeremiah 51. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor, and it is time to thresh her. Yet a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. Verse 37. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment, and an hissing, without an inhabitant, 
the cities are a desolation, a dry land, and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, neither doth any son of man pass thereby. Verse 44. And I will punish Bel, that's Bel Marduk in Babylon. That was, ba that was Nebuchadnezzar's God, Bel Marduk. And I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he hath swallowed up, and the nation shall not flow together any more unto him. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Watch this now. God is making a call. Verse 45. My people, go out of the midst of her. That's not, there's no other gate to God. Come out of her confusion, suggesting that there's another way. Come out of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. So Nebuchadnezzar had this great dream. The Bible says, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, this is Daniel 2 verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep wake from him. Have you ever had one of those dreams, friends? <laughs> you just woke up in a cold sweat, and you are trying to remember what was that dream about, and you're seeking answers. Maybe you talk to your wife if you're married, or you speak to some friends, and you're trying to find, you're trying to ascertain what was that dream? What did it mean? And you cannot remember. And you go to sleep the next night and you're hoping that you will get the dream again, but it does not come. Maybe you just ate food late that night. Or maybe it was all the images that you saw that day. All the different things that you, were, that you envisioned as you were about. And all those things just come crashing down into your mind. And what happened? They come into a dream in your head. But Nebuchadnezzar's dream was more than this. For God was talking to Nebuchadnezzar that very night. God was talking to Nebuchadnezzar that night. Let's go on. Verse 2, Daniel 2. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know, to know the dream. Nebuchadnezzar wants to know. He wants the answer to this dream that he has had. And so the Bible continues. Look at verse 4 now. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syria. O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. You know, explain to us what you have dreamt, and then we will give you an understanding of what it is. <laughs> Verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. I can't remember. If ye will not make known unto me the dream, with the interpretation thereof, he shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. The king is furious now. He's asking them to read his mind. Not even the devil can read your mind. Only God knows the heart and mind of men. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar is calling them to, to do. And Nebuchadnezzar is serious. Go to Jeremiah 29, verse 22. Jeremiah 29 and verse 22. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar is serious. He's not playing. He, he's a king uh, that did not play. Look at verse 22 of um, Jeremiah 29. And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of Judah, which are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. He'll roast you. He'll cut you in pieces. He'll make your house a dunghill. He's furious. Verse 6. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Verse 7, they answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation thereof. They, they have no answers. You know, the, the king is demanding something that they cannot relate to. This is, a, this is a demand over our heads. Verse 8, the king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time, because you see the thing, is gone for me. They're trying to buy time. Is that what we do when we are puzzled? You know, they're trying to get an advantage. They're trying to buy time. 
and hopefully persuade the king to, 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 to share that which he has dreamt, but he can't remember. Not a thing in the dream has come, come back into his mind. Verse 9. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree. One decree. He's making a sentence now. He's making a law. There is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that he can show me the interpretation thereof. He called them. They didn't call him. He called them in these astrologers and magicians and dreamers, you know, and sorcerers. He called them in, and now he's disrespecting them. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Let's go down to verse uh, uh, 10 now. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldeans. They're sharing something that, in my mind, the Holy Spirit put into their hearts to say. Because God would not have his people, those of whom he has created, whether heathen or Christian, to delve into the darkness of this world such as this. Let's go to Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 13. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 13. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 13. Let you look here in the Bible, the pages of the Bible turn. Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 to 13. Let's see what the Bible says there. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass to the fire or that useth divination. Remember that word, divination, you know, crystal ball, magical scroll, you know, hocus pocus, whatever you may want to call it. Oracle, mm -hmm. earthly oracle, worldly oracle, devilish oracle or an observer of times, you know, to read the stars. You know, you, you look in the newspaper and you want to read the horoscopes. What is that? Horoscopes, horror, come on now. Read the stars, the observer of times, or an enchanter, you know, a palm reader, um, or a witch. Hmm. Those, who, those who, like warlocks, you know, those who practice magic, Suggest that they could create spells. 11, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Those who make inquiry of the dead, suggesting that they could bring up the dead and talk to the dead. Hmm. Verse 12, for all that do these things, God says, are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. God didn't even want this kind of things next to his people Israel. Verse 13, finally, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. So these type of things brings imperfection. They disconnect you from God. Shall we continue? Verse 11. And it is a real thing, difficult, they suggested to the king, that the king required, and there is none other that can Show it before the king, except the gods whose dwellings is not with flesh. <laughs> now, they may not have been talking about the God of heaven, but in my mind, the Holy Spirit put them, put it in their hearts to say this. So I would suggest, yes, the God of heaven is here being talked about. Only he alone can reveal such a thing. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar went to the astrologers and Bel Marduk because that's what, that's what Nebuchadnezzar knew. Didn't he receive some good examples from Daniel, Michelle, Azariah, and Ananiah? Of course. But he didn't want to consult them because they worshiped the God of heaven. They didn't worship his gods, his idols. And so this is why he went to the magicians and astrologers and sorcerers to give him information and went to his god, Bel Marduk, instead of going to the creator God of heaven. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 to 12. 1 Corinthians 2. Verse 9 to 12 has this to say to us. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 to 12. Let's go there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
and verses 9 to 12. The Bible says there, but it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Only God can put those things in our heart, verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now we cannot know all that God knows, but that which we need to know, as it is in these 66 books, God has revealed to us and our children. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. And verse 12, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We want to understand the things of God. We get it through his revealed will in his holy word. Verse 12. For this cause the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. 13. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they saw Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Because remember what chapter 1 says. They were, they were of the princes. They were wise men that were taken from from, from Jerusalem, from Judah. Verse 14. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Ariak, the captain of the king's guard, which was come forth, which has gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. 15. And he answered and said to Ariak, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Ariak made the thing known to Daniel. 16. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. You know, uh, back there um, in, in verse 8, you know, they would gain the time, and now here is Daniel saying, give me some time. <laughs> Bold and brave, because Daniel needs to pray. So let's see it. Let's see it. Verse 17, then Daniel went to his house. And made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. He didn't use the names of the Babylonian name that Nebuchadnezzar gave them. Verse 18, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven, strong faith, friends, concerning this secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. He want, he's acknowledging the goodness and power of God the God of heaven, that God knows secrets and God can reveal that which Nebuchadnezzar have in his mind because God can read the heart of man. Verse 19, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Always turn and give God praise, friends, when he has blessed you. Don't just walk away glorifying yourself. Always fall down on your knees in humbleness and humility. Give God praise for his goodness. Verse 20, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Knowledge will be given to us to those who wants understanding from God, who wants to know the things that God has given to us in his holy word, we should be like Issachar, knowing the time, understanding prophecies, understanding the things of God, because he has laid them out for us in his holy word. I thank thee, this is Daniel giving praise to God, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. And so Daniel went into the king, and verse 24, therefore Daniel went in unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said, thus unto him, destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king 
the interpretation, the interpretation. And so as Daniel went in before the king, here is Nebuchadnezzar, the king asked Daniel, who also called Belteshazzar, Daniel, God is my judge. Now Belteshazzar, belief, protect the king. Belmarduk, protect the king from the God of Daniel. No. Belmarduk is an idol. But the God that Daniel served, he is God. That's why his name, God is my judge. Are you able, Nebuchadnezzar asked, to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel 2 and verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know, did, did Daniel have the answer? Is Daniel wiser than his astrologers? and sorcerers, and magicians, and all the Chaldeans? Is Daniel wiser? <laughs> Let's see. Verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? Is it's almost like it's almost like he's, he's, he's mocking him. You want these men to tell you the determination, how to determine history, how to determine the destiny of the world. This is what you're asking these men to, to, to share with you, O King, to share the destiny of the future, the destiny of the universe. Only God has that in his hand. And so Daniel continue to give praise to God, but there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, what shall be in time to come. Daniel is bold. Daniel is standing on the principles of God and letting Nebuchadnezzar know who he stand by, who he trusts and he trusts in the God of heaven not in the things of Nebuchadnezzar. And so Daniel starts explaining to him the dream. Nebuchadnezzar's mind starts unfolding, unraveling that which was like a cobweb in his mind. Now it's starting to be made, to be made plain. The things start coming back into his mind as Daniel is explaining to him what he dreamt. Only now that he can recognize, oh, Yes, those are the things I dreamt. And this great stone came and break the image in pieces and created a new kingdom. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a look into the future, friends. A look into the future. This is what God gave Nebuchadnezzar in that dream. Verse 37 and 38, Daniel 2. You, O king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. Daniel is giving explanation what the dream means, what it meant. Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand what these symbols mean, what these metals meant, and what God was trying to say to him. You, O oh king, are a king of kings. You are this head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar can probably fix, fix her figure out in his mind, can fix in his mind, yeah, yes, I am this king of head of gold. Look at my great Babylon I have built. This great uh, oasis, in a sense, much of it to the dedication of his wife, to his wife, that Nebuchadnezzar made this great kingdom. And so we look in Isaiah 13, verse, Isaiah verse chapter 13, verses 17 to verse 22. Go there with me. Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, verses 17 to 22. Isaiah 13, starting at verse 17, talking about this great kingdom. Verse 17, Isaiah 13. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them. Against who? 
which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Verse 18. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, okay, so Babylon shall not last forever. The Medes, the Medes and Persians, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah doesn't exist anymore. Never to be inhabited. Let's see, continue. Verse 20. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall be, it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Saddam Hussein, if he was not aware of this, should have read this. And maybe if he read it, seek to ignore it and defy the, the God of heaven. Verse 21. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there, verse 22. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be, shall not be prolonged. This is God's prophecy that Nebuchadnezzar's great Babylon shall come to an end. This great Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar built was the Lion Kingdom. That's, that's also recorded in the book of Daniel, the Lion Kingdom. Hmm? Over there in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 7, we look at verse Four, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, come to its end, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And then the next verse says, and behold, another beast. So the kingdom of Babylon was not to last forever. It came to its end its chest and arms of silver, verse 32 of Daniel 2. Let's look again, Isaiah 45 and verse one. Isaiah 45 and verse one. Let the, let the pages turn in the Bible, friends. Isaiah 45 and verse one. The Bible says there, thus saith the Lord, God speaking, to the anointed, to Cyrus, about a hundred years before this man is born, God is, proclaiming this prophecy to Isaiah, and Isaiah penned this in his book, Isaiah, in the Bible, concerning Cyrus, over a hundred years before he was born. Thus saith the Lord to the, his anointed, to Cyrus, even called him by name, named him before he was born, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the, the loins of kings to open before him, the two leaf gates and the gates shall not shall not be shut. Now go to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20 now. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20. Let's see if the Bible has this name in Daniel. Verse 20, Daniel chapter 8. The ram, which also symbolized Medo Persians, which thou sawest, having two horns, Medes and Persians, are the kings of Media and Persia. The Bible tells you clearly what kingdom was going to take over Babylon, and it has uh, arms, his chest and arms were of, of silver. Verse 39 says, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Again, Daniel 8, verse 20 and verse 21. Daniel 8, verse 20, and verse 21. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. What happened in verse 21 now? And the rough goat is the king of Gracia. So after the Median, Medes and Persians, Greece took over and its great king, Alexander the Great. And the great iron and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Alexander the Great ruled Babylon. 
bronze. Then, finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Oh, friends, God is laying out this prophecy, laying out the history of the world. The ambitious design of conquest, which might have defeat, been defeated by the seasonable conspiracy of mankind, which was attempted and achieved, and the perpetual violation of justice was maintained by the political virtues of prudence and courage. The arms of the Republic, sometimes vanquished in battle, always victorious in war, advanced with rapid steps to the Euphrates, the Danube, the Rhine, and the ocean, and the image of gold or silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successive, successfully, successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. This is Edward Gibbon, Edward Gibbon, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, 1776 to 1788, is when this man wrote this, this history. So here the gold of Babylon, silver, Muslim Persian, brass, Greece. They were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. We could go back to the days of Jesus near 2,000 years ago and know that Rome ruled the world. Verse 41, and whereas thou sowest the feet and toes of part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron for as much as thou sowest the iron mixed with murray clay mixed with murray clay. I find this to be very interesting. God is letting us know something here. Let's go to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. This is verse 7 to 9. Isaiah 64, verses 7 to 9. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. Watch this. We are the clay, and thou art the potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Verse 9, be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Potter's clay can be molded and fashioned. Yes, when God fashions and molds us, it is very painful, friends, but God is making us to be jewels in his crown. So allow the process of God to work in you and in me to fashion us and mold us to be true sons and daughters of God, fitted for the kingdom of glory, fitted for we are angels who have never sinned, where God will sing, sing for us, Jesus lives there, the Holy Spirit lives there, in a world, in a universe that has no sin and no more of death. We are potter's clay, and God can mold us because he is the potter, that's what the Bible lets us to know here. Potter, potter's clay can be shaped. For potter's clay has no iron in it. Listen to that. No, and no other impurities. Let's go to Jeremiah. Let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 18. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Let the pages, let the pages in the Bible turn, friends. As we look there, Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house. Yes, and there I shall cause thee to hear my words. Verse 3. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the vessels, on the wheels. Verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Verse 5, 
Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, verse 6, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. God wants to fashion us. God wants to mold us so that we will become good in his hand, in his hand. Good in his hand. Look over there at Romans. Let's go to a, let's go to a New Testament verse, a New Testament text. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, verses 20 to 26. Romans chapter 9, verses 20 to 26. What does God want to do with you? What does God want to do with me? Romans chapter 9, verses 20 to 26. Verse 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing form? Say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Let God make you to be a saint. When God, when God creates you, how could you, how could you question God? Verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay? Yes. God has power over the, the clay to fashion it. If, if, if he or she would submit themselves to God, of course, of the same lamp to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Verse 22. What if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known and do it with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. This is what God is doing, preparing us unto glory. Verse 24. He must, whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Verse 25, as it see it also in O.C., Isaiah that is, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. Verse 26, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, they shall they be called the children of the living God. I want to be called a child of the living God. I want to be potter's clay. I don't want to be miry clay, for miry clay is wet and soggy and swampy. See, that can mix with iron. That can mingle with error, miry clay. Let's look over, let's look, is that in the Bible? Let's look over there and see what miry clay over there in Psalm 40, Psalm 40 and verse two. Psalm 40, go there, Psalm 40 and verse two. Let's go to verse one, Psalm, Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Verse 2, Psalm 40. He brought me up also out of an hard pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. God wants to even get you out of the miry clay. For the potter's clay in God's hand, if God can fashion it as to what he desires, but even out of the miry clay, God can call us out of, that out of that confusion, out of that mixing with error, mixing with sin, mixing with the world, mixing with the devil. Even in that wet, soggy, swampy place, God can deliver you out of the miry clay. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Ezekiel, Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47. Oh, it's, it's good to, 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 to see the truths of the Bible, friend, to just build on it. Ezekiel 47, verses 10 to 12. Ezekiel 47, verse 10 says, And it shall come to pass that the fishes shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Enegalim. They shall be their place to spread forth nets, their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. Verse 11, but the miry places, miry clay, therefore, and the marshes, the marsh land, therefore shall not be healed. They shall not be given to salt. So, sorry, they shall be given to salt. They shall not be healed, shall be given to salt. Why? Because they would not, let God work them, work upon them. Verse 12, and by the river upon the bank thereof, 
on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. He shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. God can bring us out of the mighty places, out of the marshes, but we have to submit ourselves to him. Otherwise, as the Bible says, we will not be healed. Look at Revelation 22 and verse 2. Look at Revelation 22. Look at verse 1. Start at verse 1. Revelation 22, the last book of the Bible. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Just as Ezekiel was talking about, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 2 now. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded a fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. God can heal us even out of the miry clay. Friends of mine, God can heal us. God can strengthen us. But Nebuchadnezzar, he would have none of this. No kingdom is coming after me, he thought. I'm going to make my kingdom. This is, this is God's prophecy to him. Let's see this. suggesting that his kingdom would last forever. But God was making a point, and Nebuchadnezzar needed to hear it and needed to listen to it. The dream was given the king to show him that earthly kingdoms were not enduring, they don't last, but would pass away and be followed by the kingdom of the prince of heaven, Jesus, which should fill the whole earth, but Nebuchadnezzar determined to make an image like that which he had seen. Only it was to be made of all gold. This idol of gold was to be a most imposing spectacle and was to take the place of God and be worshipped as God. Manuscript 12, Manuscript 219, Paragraph 1. This was Nebuchadnezzar's desire. He wants his kingdom to last forever. But the stone represents the kingdom of God, where the Prince of Heaven, Jesus the righteous, Jesus himself, that his kingdom is the only kingdom that can last forever. Let's see another. The Sunday idol is set up as was this image. Human laws demand that it be worshipped as sacred and holy, thus putting it where God's holy Sabbath should be. God has his seventh Sabbath as recorded in the Bible. Men speak great swelling words and exalt their power, placing themselves where God should be. Sitting in the temple of God, they strive to make themselves as God, showing themselves to be God. Has this been realized? God showed us in his word, Genesis chapter 2. Go there. This is, this is before sin, friends. This is before sin. God showed us in his word. Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them, verse 2, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God has set aside a day for worship, but man, under the direction of Lucifer, under the direction of Diab, under the direction of Satan, under the direction of Azazel, whatever you may want to call him, he suggests that his way is a better way. And so now the word, some of us are in this era of Sunday sacredness, of Sunday worship, thinking that it is in the Bible when it is not. The seventh day, the Sabbath day of God is what God has laid aside for worship, for praise. And friends, we need to know this error and understand this error and come away from it. God calls us to come out. The Sunday idol is set up as was this image. That's this idol set up and soon to be made law in this land and the world. Pius the 12th affirmed strongly the queenship of Mary, inserting in the calendar for May 31st a new feast of Mary Queen. Pius the 12th consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Mother and Queen, October 31st, 1942, as a public recognition of her queenship, New Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 9, page 386. I don't want to be consecrated to the queenship of Mary. She is dead and in the grave. This is idol worship. This is spiritualism, friend of mine. Mary considered the co-redentrix. Look, she's the one receiving the crowns of thorn from what the picture depicts to be Jesus. And she's the one that has the male scars in her hand. I have seen these pictures. They're at the Vatican in Rome. I have been there and taken these pictures of my own self, friends of mine. And so we look to Psalm 99, verse 1. Go there with me. What has man done? Or what has man sought to do to replace that which God has set up in the kingdom of heaven, in heaven itself? Look here. Psalm 99, verse 1. The Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. Mm. He sitteth between the cherubims. Who? The Lord. Jehovah, Yahweh, God. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is high above all the people. So what should we do? Verse 3, let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. We must recognize who God is and recognize that he is the one that sits between the cherubims, these powerful angels in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and the testimony of God. The Ten Commandments sits right in the center. Let's see, Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses three and four. What is man seeking to do? God has already put these things in his word, friends. So we don't, we don't need to be deceived, but we need to be made aware. And so this is what I'm seeking to do today. Well, let's go back to verse one. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together with him, this is soon to be realized. Look at verse two. That he be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is at hand, friends. Even at the doors, look at verse three now, as is in our lesson. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. What has man done on earth here? The Pope of Rome, sitting between two cherubims, suggesting that he is God on earth. No friends, God seated on high. He seated between the two cherubim. We saw that in Psalm 99 and verse one. And so because of this, Protestant America, as a matter of fact, Protestants of the world has suggest that the protest that Martin Luther started back in 1517 is over. And Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses on a church door October 31st, 1517, which is usually marked as the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And it, with Martin Luther, I say, here I stand and no other. I stand with God, I stand with Jesus. I keep protesting, I'm still a Protestant. Protesting the errors of the world, seeking not to mingle with them, seeking not to be associated with them. My duty, your duty, is to proclaim the truth as it is in God's word. Protestantism is not over, friends of mine. Here, one who should represent truth. Dr. Ganun Dia, Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the Worldwide Southern Venice Church, associating, mingling, compromising. No, friends, there is no compromise of the truth of God's word. What do they say? The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches, for the Son of God became man so that we might become God. That's blasphemy. The only begotten Son of God wanted to make us sharers in his divinity, assume our nature so that he made man, might make men gods. We are not gods, friends. That was an error taught to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And in listening to that error from Satan, from Lucifer, they became sinners. And we have been plunged into a world of darkness, except it be for the light of Jesus Christ to the Holy Spirit. We would be all lost. But there is salvation found in Jesus Christ. Marvel and rejoice, we have become Christ. No friends, we belong to Christ. We are not Christ. And so in their Vulgate, their Bible, the book of Genesis chapter three, the serpent's craft, remember that? Serpent's craft, craft, magic, spell, sorcery, the fall of our first parents, their punishment, the promise of, the, of our Redeemer. I don't know what Redeemer is promised there. What do they say? Verse three, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the paradise, God hath commanded us that we should not eat and that we should not touch it, lest perhaps we die. That's not what the Bible says. I will put enmities between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head and thou shall lie in wait for her heal. Let's see what Genesis chapter three, verse three and verse 15 says. Let's read it from the King James Version and see what the Bible has to say. Genesis three and verse three. What are the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God had said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Is that a man even alive today? No, they are dead. They shall not, they shall, lest ye shall surely, no. You will die. You shall not surely die? No, that's the, that's the lie that the devil made to Adam and Eve. But that's what he says there in verse four, and the serpent, that's Lucifer, that's Satan speaking to the serpent. Serpents can't speak. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. It's either you shall die or you shall not surely. <laughs> what is it? It's, it? it's looking to confuse them right here. But you shall die, surely die. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel, not her heel. This is what the Bible, that prophecy is speaking about the savior in Jesus Christ who will die on Calvary's cross for your sin and my sin, 
so that we will be redeemed. This is error. The Great Controversy, Ellen G. White, page 588, 1888 edition. To the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, who? Satan will bring the people under his deceptions, while the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, that's immortality of the soul, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome, that's Sunday sacredness. So Sunday sacredness only comes from Rome, that's not from God. Sunday sacredness finds its definition only in Rome, in man, in the Vatican, in popery. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach across over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power, and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. This is just ahead, friends. Study it in the Bible. Hear it from this from this video today. What can be better than liberty of conscience? And this is what the Constitution of the United States guarantees to every American. On this point, in 1854, watch this now, the Pope said, the absurd and erroneous doctrines are ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most, what's that word? Pestilential error. A pest, he said, of all others, most to be dreaded in a state. This was reiterated in 1864 by the same Pope, writing of these, of, of those who assert the liberty of conscience and of religious worship, and all such as maintain that the church may not employ force. The Archbishop of St. Louis writes, heresy and unbelief are crimes and are punished as other crimes, where the Catholic religion is an essential part of the law of the land. Pope Pius the ninth encyclical letter of August 15, 18, 1854. And who is the man sitting right behind the Pope when he came to America? The one who's going to be the next president of the United States of America. Watch, friends, we are in a crisis. An opinion by Catherine Rampey, a columnist. Columnist, what did she have to say? Is this Barr's cry for help? Hmm. October 14, 2014. Let's see it. On Friday, in a closed-door speech at the University of Notre Dame, a Catholic institution, Attorney General William Barr, William P. Barr, talked at length about a campaign to destroy the traditional moral order. Hmm. Something wrong with morality? The alleged perpetrator of this campaign, militant secularists, who insist upon keeping government institutions free from the influence of any faith creed, any faith or creed. To be clear, this was not merely an affirmation delivered by a devout Catholic. See that? While visiting a Catholic university of how privately taught religious values can contribute to character development or stronger communities. Given such crises, Barr urged his audience to fight back against so-called progressives and others who insist upon respecting America's pesky, constitutionally mandated Separation of church and state is not the same thing that the Pope says in 1854. Pestilent error, a pest. Same words, friends. Hmm. Liberty Magazine, Courtship Between Church and State by Edwin Cook, November, December, 2015. And who is here again in this picture? the next president of the United States, Joe Biden. In September 2015, Pope Francis I made history by addressing a joint session of the United States Congress, first ever. His address to the US Congress was historic for several reasons. Not only is 
is he the first pope to speak before the bicameral legislature? But also his actions call into question the American concept of separation of church and state. Hmm. American founders such as Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson James Madison, et al., and et cetera, were all enough, well acquainted, well enough acquainted with European history to know that they wished to found a government without a king and a church without a pope. That's what America is built on. That's what America established itself on. That's America's foundation. It's a Protestant nation. Is this about to change? It seems like it is on that course to be changed, friends. That church and state is going to unite. And when that happens, persecution comes to those who seek to be obedient to God's word. Revelation 13, verse 4. He had two horns like a lamb. This is a description. This is a description of America. Two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. This is where America is headed. Protestantism and republicanism, not, not, not Republican uh, Party, republicanism, meaning a state without a pope, a church, a church without a pope and a state without a king. Republicanism, Protestantism, this is what this army, army is. Though professing to be followers of the Lamb of God, men become imbued with the spirit of the dragon. They profess to be meek and humble, but they speak and legislate with the spirit of Satan, showing by their actions that they are the opposite, the opposite of what they profess to be. This lamb-like power, United States of America, unites with the dragon, papacy, Roman Catholicism, in making war upon those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Maranatha, or manuscripts, Maranatha, 191, paragraph one, sorry, Maranatha, 191, paragraph, paragraph one. This is where we are today, friends. And Satan unites with Protestants and Papists acting in consort with them as the God of this world. Mm -hmm. dictating to men as if they were the subjects of his kingdom to be handled and governed and controlled as he pleases. Even today, the Pope is speaking like this. If men will not agree to trample on the foot the commandments of God, the spirit of the dragon is revealed. They are imprisoned, brought before councils and fined. You could read the history of the Huguenots and of the Dark Ages, friends, and know this to be true. Thus, Satan usurps the prerogatives of Jehovah. The man of sin sits in the seat of God, proclaiming himself to be God and acting above God. Maranatha 191, paragraph one, as was continued, as was continued, friends. And so we continue. Verse 44 of Daniel 2, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Jesus is going to set up a kingdom, friends, which shall never be destroyed. It shall last forever. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. All the errors and ideologies of the world, the sins of the world, the kingdoms of the world, the rulers of the world who seek to oppose God will come to their end, will be destroyed. This is what the Bible is letting us know here. What will this kingdom be like? What shall we do there? The Bible is plain. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Revelation 21 and verse four. Let's go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse one and Revelation 21, sorry. Revelation 21. Verse 1 and 2. Revelation 21, 
verse 1 and verse 2. Revelation 21, verse 1 and verse 2. The Bible says there, And I saw a new heaven, yes, and a new earth, everything made new by God. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There were no more. All this that you see shall be renewed, shall be destroyed. And God is going to make everything new. And there was no more sea, verse 2, meaning no separation, no disconnect. We shall all be one people under God. Verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. This is the event that just about to take place, friends of mine. God is about to establish his kingdom. There shall be no more pain, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying. All things shall be made new. Verse 35 of Daniel 2, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. God has a plan. I want to be a part of this plan. How about you? I'm inviting you, friends. And so we have the history, the world history foretold, the history of nations. Daniel 2, verse 31 to 45, depicting Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Head of gold, Babylon. Lasted, they say, from 605 to 539, it came to its end. Then the breast of silver, Medes and Persians took over from 539 BC to 331 BC. Then the thighs of brass, Greece, from 331 BC to 168 BC. Greece didn't last forever. It brought many learning to us, but didn't last forever. Legs of iron, Rome, from 168 BC and split up into 10 kings and to 10 parts in the year 476 AD and Astrogoths and Visigoths and Lomb Lombards and uh, many different nations, 10 different nations split Rome into 10 parts. Rome didn't last forever. But of course we know that the feet of iron and clay, there's still some mingling of the teachings of Rome still in our day today. Revived Roman Empire. AD 476 to the second advent, to the second coming of Jesus, the European, the European Union. This, this is where we are today in the toenails, in the toenails of time as it reflects Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The mingle, mingled churchcraft, remember? When we talked about craft, craft shall practice, mingled churchcraft and statecraft. Manuscript releases, volume one. Numbers 19 to 96, <clears throat> all right? Page 51. This is this craft that we read earlier from the Dewey Bible. Craft, I told you was to remember that word. We have come to a time, Energy White says, when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was mixed with the miry clay. Iron does mix with potter's clay. Potter's clay does have iron in, iron in it. It's free from other impurities. But miry clay, it can mix with iron. But God can bring a people out. God has a people, a chosen people, whose dis discernment must be sanctified, who must not become unholy by laying upon the foundation wood, hay, and stubble. Hmm? Every soul who is loyal to the commandments of God will see that the distinguishing features of our faith is the, is the seventh day Sabbath. If the government would honor the Sabbath as God has commanded, it would stand in the strength of God and in defense of the faith once delivered unto, unto the saints. She continues, but statesmen will uphold the spurious Sabbath, Sunday sacredness, and will mingle their religious faith with the observance of this child of the papacy. Sunday sacredness is a child of the papacy of Roman Catholicism, friends. Placing it above the Sabbath, which the Lord has sanctified and blessed. That's Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3. What the prophet says, the Bible says, setting it apart for man to keep holy as a sign between him and his people 
to a thousand generations, the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. The union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results, persecution, death. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance, friends. We are heading to a place, to a, to a place where we will not pass, where God would has drawn a line and said we would not pass that boundary. God has made boundaries, friends. And soon those boundaries will be realized. But what has they done in America? What is going on in our world? July 22nd, 2016, CNN, as they anointed this man, put a Bible in his hand, they placed a Bible in his hand, Paula White and many others, Jeffries and others, laid hands on him, that's, that's um, Donald Trump, and anointed him as president of the United States of America. At this moment, I would like to thank the evangelical and religious community in general who have been so good to me and so supportive, Trump says. You have much to contribute to our politics, yet our laws prevent you from speaking your minds from your own pulpits. An amendment pushed by Lyndon Johnson many years ago threatens religious institutions with a loss of their tax-exempt status if they openly advocate their political views. I am going to work very hard to repeal that language and protect free speech for all Americans. We can accomplish these great things. And he did just that. He did just that, friends. Pass laws that you can now stand in your pulpit and proclaim to your parishioners, to those sitting in the pews, who to vote for. Did this man believe such thing? Let's hear what he has to say. For well, this is in the 1960s, friends. And he has much worth to say concerning this church. I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act, and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote when no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference, and when no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jewish, where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source. When no religious body seeks to impose its will, directly or indirectly, upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. That's so clear. And so, the prophet Ellen G. White speaks to this, not speak to what he said, but has words that speaks to such a, 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 a demarcation, a separation of church and state. He says, they have invested, invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. This is not what uh, President John F. Kennedy believed. He believed in a separation of church and state. But what has happened today? What is going on in our world today? They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. This is what she prophesied long before uh, John F. Kennedy was even born in the 1890s. Prophesying that these things is gonna come about in America and have they been realized? Yes. They have invested their strength in politics and have united the papacy united with the papacy, but the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will be coiled upon themselves. Manuscript 63, 1899, page 12 and page 13. This is where we are, we are today. 
Let's look to the book of Ephesians. Let's look to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Again, we are still in Daniel 2. You'll continue in Daniel 2. Just hold on to Daniel 2 while you turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Right there after the book of Galatians is the book Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13 to verse 15. The Bible says, verse 13, Till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is where God is seeking to lead us. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. Here's that word again. Craft, witchcraft, sorcery, necromancing, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even, even Christ. This is the direction of the child of God. This is the direction that we must go, friends, that we must grow up into Christ and not be deceived by the things of the world. Again, let's look. Let, we always try to balance what we're speaking about. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, Old Testament. New Testament, all of God's word is seamless. Speak one word, one gospel, one Bible. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination, oracle, crystal ball, magical scroll, or an observer of times, star reasons, astrology, mm -hmm. looking the newspaper and reading your horoscope, reading the times, observer of times, and an enchanter or an enchanter or a witch, those who seek to practice magic. That's not of God. Use it divination. Did you hear that? Using divination. Is that something shared by any church on planet Earth? Dear friends, in fulfillment of the Petrine Monas, this, is, this was something written by um, La, La, La Observer Romano, weekly edition in English 21, 1999. Pope Benedict XVI, this is Pope John Paul. I intend to strengthen your faith in the identity of Christ and in your own identity as other Christ. Isn't that what their catechism states? Take holy pride in being called and being especially humble before so great a dignity in the awareness of your human weakness. Other Christ. And so take this, take, this is my body. As they say the words, they use divin divinization, friends, to, to, to make the bread into the very flesh, the body of Christ, and make the wine into the very blood of Christ, and drink it and eat it, they say. That's what they suggest. That's divination. That's necromancer. That's magic. That's witchcraft. During the procession and in adoration, we look at the consecrated hosts. Is that what they're talking about? The most simple type of bread and nourishment made only of a little flour and water. In this way, it appears as the food of the poor, those to whom the Lord made himself closest in the first place. And so, looking closely at this little piece of white host, this bread of the poor appears to us as a synthesis of creation. You are creating? By what means? Go down here. Look at the underline. Creation is projected towards divinization. Divining. Divining? The mystery of the passion is hidden in the bread made of ground grain, flour, the ground wheat. Presuppose the death and resurrection of the grain. In being ground and baked, it carries in itself once again, the same mystery of the passion. Only through death does resurrection arise. 
as does the fruit and new life. Wow. This is a lot of power that they're suggesting that they have to make the, the very bread into the very flesh of Christ and the wine into the very blood of Christ through divinization, they suggest. And that's what you find on their very decal. This is in the Vatican Museum in Rome, at Saint, in St. Peter's. What does it say? Dragon on the papal crest in Vatican Museum. Yes, I've seen it. Vatis, meaning diviner. Can, meaning serpent. So Vatican, the divining serpent, the divining of Satan. They're under the, the divining spirit of Satan to do what they do, to say that they can turn the bread into the very blood of Christ and the wine into the, uh, the, wine into the very blood of, blood of Christ and the bread into the very flesh of Christ. This is an amazing, this is an amazing thing, friends of mine, that they're suggesting that they, that they can do. Wow. Revelation 13 and verse 12. How the image of the beast, how the image of the beast, how the image to the beast evolves, sorry, how the image to the beast evolves. Revelation 13 and verse 12. Revelation 13 and verse 12, the Bible says, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her ends. The image to the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. When Sunday observance shall be enforced by law, notice this, enforced by law, and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then, and only then, whoever shall transgress the command of God to obey a precept which has no higher authority than that of Rome, will thereby honor popery above God, honor Roman Catholicism above God, honor the papacy above God, honor error above God, honor sin and Satan above God. The papacy, Roman Catholicism, the Pope, he is paying homage, he is paying homage to Rome and to the power which enforces the institution ordained by Rome. He is worshiping the beast and his image. This is where we are today, friends. This is where we are today. Great Controversy, 1888, 449, paragraph one. As men then reject the institution which God has declared to be the sign of his authority and honor in its stead, that which Rome has chosen as the token of her supremacy, they will thereby accept the sign of the allegiance of Rome, the mark of the beast. And it is not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people, and this I'm hoping I'm setting it before you, and they are brought to choose. You must make a choice between the commandments of God and the commandments of men that those who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. What is this saying? No one has the mark of the beast today, but when this is plainly set before the people and a law is made as the sign of man's authority over God's authority, and the mark of the beast and the image of the beast is set up, Again, not until the issue is thus plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Then will the mark of the beast be inflicted 
then the mark of the beast would be inflicted, friends. Go with me to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. Again, we are still in Daniel, but we're just reading a few verses to just clue in on what we are looking at today. To just clue in on it. Revelation 14, verse 9 and verse 10. Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says there, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, by thinking and by doing, 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of, of the Lamb. So the wrath of God will be poured out upon those who seek to accept the mark of the beast when it is enforced, friends, when it is the authority that is brought to the world over God's authority. The Sabbath versus Sunday issue joins. Great controversy six or seven. As the controversy extends into new fields and the minds of the people are called to God's downtrodden law, Satan is astir. Mm -hmm. The power attending the message will only madden those who oppose it. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. Friends, this is what she's saying that the clergy will do. Seek to bring you falsehood, to appease you, to make you happy, and turn you away from the things of God with almost superhuman effort they will try to do it. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power and in this work, papists and Protestants unite. This is where the world is headed, friends. This is the direction that the world is headed. The dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure, Daniel 2 verse 45. Yes, that prophecy in Daniel over 2,500 years ago, it is still true today. It still holds true today. God prophecies does not fail. We are in the tunnels of time where Rome is mingling with other nations and the religions are mingling with Roman Catholicism and error seeking to bring this world to its knees in error, but only God. He's the one that's in called control. He's the only one that can beat out where this is headed. Revelation 21, if you were still in that book, Revelation 21, verse five and verse seven. Look what it says there, verse five. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. See what God is gonna do. I trust in God, the prophecy is sure. God will make all things new. His kingdom shall be established. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. True words, sure words. Verse seven, he that overcometh. Oh yes, friends, God calls us to overcome sin, to overcome Satan. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son or my daughter. I want to be a son of God. Don't you want to be a son of God? And you can be a son. And God also calls you to also be a daughter. We can be sons and daughters of God. But we must be obedient to his holy word. We must be obedient to his holy word, friends of mine. According to the vision of earthly rule, given in Daniel 2, under the symbols of the great image of gold, Silver, gold, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, silver, Medes and Persians, brass, Greece, iron, Rome, the iron monarchy of Rome, and iron mixed with Murray clay, church, craft, state, craft, which are there explained as representing the kingdoms of this world from Babylon down to the fourth kingdom, which was to be strong as iron, and which in fact was the kingdom of Rome which was to be divided, I have said that already into 10 parts, 
the kingdom of the God of heaven is not said to be set up until after the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, is divided into ten parts. It has been divided. So God's kingdom is about to be, to, to be established and take place in the days of Christ and for 300 years after, no such ten parts existed. The Roman Empire was divided into ten parts between the years 356 and 483 AD, those years. Years. 476, as a matter of fact. The image could not be smitten on the feet before the feet existed. So when people are talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, and Antiochus Epiphanes will fulfill the abomination of desolation as spoken, spoken of by Daniel, that can't be true. Because the image could not be smitten on the feet before the feet existed. <laughs> and the feet is the iron monarchy of Rome, not Antiochus Epiphanes, as, this, as he was one of um, the Greek um, rulers after Alexander the Great. No, friends. Daniel, um, Daniel is spoken of by, 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 Jesus, by Jesus himself in, um, in, Matthew, in Matthew 24. Right, where, where Jesus speaks about the great tribulation. Look what it says in verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, Jesus used the very phrase, the very words. Verse 15. When you see the when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who's a reader? Let him understand. What verse 16 now? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. That's the year 70. Well, 66, Cestius came first and surrounded Jerusalem, but something was occurring back in Rome, and so he left and went, went back home. And the, the Jews thought, ah, this, this prophecy that Jesus proclaimed near 70 years ago <laughs> has not taken place. We are still here, and so they remain. But those who recognized and understood the prophecy that Jesus made here in, Dan, in um, Matthew 24, left and flew to the mountains, as the Bible says. They flee Judea and went into the mountains. And Titus came back in the year 70. This is history, friends. And at that time when Titus came back, Jerusalem was burned flat and destroyed. No more temple. How do you know? A Muslim mosque sits in the place, and all that the Jews have is a wailing wall that they go to pray and put prayers into the, into the wall, praying. That's all they have. No temple is there. It's gone under Titus, the Roman, the Roman general. So the image could not be smitten on the feet before the feet existed, or in other words, before the division of the Roman Empire. So the kingdom of God, which is to fulfill, to fulfill the whole earth, brought to view in the prophecy of Daniel, was not established in the days of Christ's first advent. It is, it is soon to be established, friends. It is soon to come to pass. Antiochus Epiphanes, we need to dismiss that, that, that theory. I, I can't even call it a theology. We need to dismiss that theory, that error. The abomination of desolation is, that is by the papacy where they're seeking to establish themselves as God, as the priest who sits between the cherubims, who can forgive sin, who can absorb sin to indulgences. That's error. That's what Martin Luther protests about in 1517. And that's what we continue to protest today, that God's word is true. And what man has devised is error, friends of mine. We must trust in the very word of the living God. Again, the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof very sure. The Great Controversy, 1888, page 613, the time of trouble, chapter 39. When the third angel's message closes, the people of God have accomplished their work. 
they have received the latter rain and are prepared for the trying hour before them. The final test, it's soon to come, has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. This seal, friends, is not a mark that you can see. It means the settling into God's truth. He continues. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above, and with a loud voice says, it is done. That's soon to be proclaimed. And we will hear that voice. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Revelation 22 and verse 11. This is soon to be realized, friends. Are you making ready? Am I making ready? Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. I want my sins to be blotted out, that God will remember them no more. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, Daniel 7, 27, is about to be given to the ears of salvation, and Jesus is to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, here to forever. Page 373, paragraph 2, also in last day events. Page 254. This is just an artist's rendition of what the kingdom of heaven might look like. Not even close. But we can, we can take it in for now. But the rainbow, it will be there showing forth the promises of God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness to us. Oh, the lion shall lay down with the lamb. Nothing shall harm them. Again, an artist's rendition. But what God has prepared, no man can describe. Romans 8, verse 17 to 19. And if children, I want to be a child of God, then heirs, heirs of God, I want to be an heir and joint heirs with Christ. Oh, the Bible is just calling you and I to this wonderful experience. If so, be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. We may suffer now on this earth. We may go to trials and tribulations and pain down here. Even suffer injustice. But glory be to God. He has a plan to rescue us from that and to save us from that. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of the sons of God. Oh, friends, are you making readiness? Are you making preparation? Are you making ready for the coming of Jesus? It is soon to be realized. There's a crisis ahead, yes. The mark of the beast, persecution, yes, is going to take over the world like this pandemic. COVID-19 that we have right now, it, it, it surpasses, encompasses the whole world. Such would the Sunday sacredness and this law that will be passed very soon, very shortly ahead. But our anchor is in Jesus Christ. We can trust him, for he will lead us through. We are in the toenails of time, friends. Soon and very soon, the manifestation of Jesus to say, it is done, and we shall hear his voice to the Orion, is soon to be realized. Are you making ready? Am I making ready? Let us pray. Father and our God, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Help that as this word go forth on YouTube, Facebook, that those who would watch will realize that we are in the tunnels of time, and we need to make ready to the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon our minds, giving us spiritual discernment to choose between truth and error, to choose the good, to choose the righteousness of Jesus Christ, so that we may be saved in his kingdom by his faith, by his merits, that we can overcome by his power and be saved. So bless us as your people, oh dear Father. Hold us in the hollow of your hands, nail scarred as they may be, they are good hands and keep us till the day of God. Keep us in the way of Jesus 
and save us at last, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, friends, until we meet again on the Desire of Ages Ministries, I have been your host, Pastor Samuel Ryan. Maranatha. <laughs>